Yo, it's your boy Scotty Rex, and I'm on Big Gold Belt Media. Checking out your boy Ryan Nixon. Let's go. What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to the channel today for another special interview. We're here to talk about the new film, Run Nixon, coming to theaters November 22nd. I am with the writer and director um, and, and somebody truly, I'm going to have a lot of questions, but before I even get into the questions, I just want to say congratulations thus far on the success right. of your new film. Uh, but nonetheless, this is Sky Direct. Sky, my brother, how you feeling today? Man, I'm blessed, baby, man. I appreciate you having me on the show, man. I'm I'm here. I'm alive. I'm I'm, I'm energized. I'm, I'm I'm ready to go, man. Put me in the fight, boss. I'm ready to I'm ready to take somebody's head off. And, and and essentially, that's that's what filmmaking is, right? Yes. You, you 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 go back to you know I I've seen the uh, GoFundMe you know back in 2019, and I don't know when truly the journey starts, which I give you opportunity to talk about. But let's just start from what I know. In 2019, you're doing a GoFundMe because you have a passion and you're getting out there and you need some funding. And we all know every filmmaker goes it truly broke in doing so. So there's that. And then the pandemic happens, which just doesn't help anything else beyond that. So it's this right. whole idea of like, man, I got to go. All right, I'm making I'm making strides. You know, I got a cast. I, I got some funding coming in. The world just gets shut down. Like, what do I do? So I need you to really talk me through when did the idea come about just the different milestones, the setbacks, but ultimately getting to this point, which again, congratulations for your film, your independent film coming to theaters November 22nd. I'm going to tell you this. I mean, cause like the making the movie, I think, and everybody that hears the story is like, yo, this is the movie. Um, it's like the pursuit of happiness. I'm, I'm going to be honest, man. I mean, um, you know, I think a lot of independents go through the whole process and, it, you know, when someone says I'm making a movie, uh, they don't realize how long it might take. Everybody wants things to happen on their time. But we started in 2018. Um, that's when the vision happened with when I was uh, actually asleep. The, the vision came from my my uh, my uncle who passed away named Bryant. And he gave me the dream of Ron Nixon. He gave me the story. He, he kind of gave me his story. And then when I woke up, uh, I called my mom, I got more information and I just started writing the script instantly. And uh, that story was amazing because, you know, it was like, I really didn't know too much about him. And for him to give me the dream and the story and for me to wake up and start writing was like, man, let's go. And at the time, I just lost our house. Me and my family is sleeping in my sister's bedroom in a little pink bedroom at my dad's house. I'm, we on a blow a bit. I don't know what to do with my life moving forward. So to have this, I was like, I finally got something. I'm going to go. I started writing the script. We wrote 80 pages. Me and my wife, Michelle Vittal, we started writing that 80 pages. And the next day, man, everything deleted. So at that point, I was mm. like, I'm going to tell you the real. Listen, advice, if you use a Mac and you write in a guest account and you use the notes, mm. don't do it. Don't do a guest, mm. guest account. I called Apple. They said, yeah, that's just what happens. Every 24 hours, it deletes everything. Oh, uh, and I was I was distraught. I was like, you know what? I got I got I got a bad situation, but I still got this dream. So I went to my dad's office. I played some music, uh, you know, some theatrical music and just started re rewriting the whole script. And then from there, you just couldn't tell me nothing. But every day I always faced all the different challenges of making the movie. Yeah, man, man, what a story. That is that is whoo. And that's just. That's just a little bit of that story. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that was the beginning. That was the beginning. From the beginning, I got beat up. You know what yeah. I'm saying? I got beat up. I got hit with one of them Mike Tyson's. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Listen, um, I always say it's, it's, you know, November, December, January is always an interesting year for yeah. films, uh, right. for critics, reviewers, whatever it may be. Um, when I saw this film uh, come across uh, my emails, I was, I was truly intrigued. I was not familiar with your work. Um, and this is this is like full transparency here. Like there's, there's a lot I really want to go off my chest with you here. I'm always leery about certain independent films. And I, when I first saw this, I was like, oh, interesting. Obviously, Little Fizz is a big name and you and you you get intrigued to say like Little Fizz acting. Yeah, I'm definitely want to see what's up with that, right? And and I wasn't familiar with your name. Uh, as, again, you are um, a co-writer and director. Um, and then some of your other cast members I just wasn't familiar with. So I was like, oh, man, this is such a busy time of the year. I just don't know if I could fit another one in. Right. But I something just gave me that energy and said, like, 
dude, go check this out. Like, check it out, legit. And I'm just baffled that this is your feature length premiere debut. Yeah, it, the, the, I, it's so polished, and like, I, I, I'm not. I don't. I don't consider myself like a stickler or a tough critic or anything. But for independent film and this being your first big whack at it here, this thing is good, man. Like straight up. And 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 then the music started hitting. I was like, oh, he definitely got music, a, a background in music. Because the, the selections, which is something that folks who don't have that musician that musician background can't really relate to certain scenes. Like every scene, whether it was the score or whether it was the soundtrack, everything was just placed very well that just kept the flow of 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 the movie going right. and then your actors this show duh, i mean definitely way blown out by little fizz and then and again he's the big name but emperor this this young kid right. yeah, this yeah. I, I had to go look at his resume i'm like this, right. you think he's been around for 10 years but he probably not even that old you know what i mean but like yeah little homie was shutting it down jordan lee brown jordan lee right man. now this that I, whatever you got him for, you yeah. you need to lock that in for a ten year contract, cause my man, my man's stock is going up. I, I'm I'm very confident in that one. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and then the name we all know in Wavy Jones, this this guy. I mean, yeah, just just this iconic in his roles, but still show versatilities uh, in, in his acting. So I, I, again, man, I just so I was just so surprised in every element of this film, production, music, acting, that this really came together. Yeah. And told the banger of a story, which was giving me, you know, alpha dog vibes at a point. Um, right. <laughs> but nonetheless, yeah. you know, we talk about a robbery and a robbery that's gone bad. It even found its way to still be very refreshing and not just, you know, pulling from all the tropes of all the other films that we've seen. So, to, again, to give it back to you, man, you put in this work since 2018. You're getting your theatrical release 2023. It's been a long road. Pandemic all the other things that you go through in terms of independent filmmaking. Um, and, and then I'm sure battling with your own mental health with the ups and downs throughout this road, but you, you you're here now when you, when you think about what you were able to create, that's really going to surprise a lot of folks here. What, what sort of those emotions? Man, those emotions is, um, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a vessel of God. Uh, you know, he, he gave me the vision to, to, to be able to, my grandfather actually, who passed away, um, who passed away, which is the father of Brian um, that passed away, my uncle. But mm -hmm. the last thing he said to me in the hospital bed was, grandson, do what you love. And um, I got it tatted on my neck somewhere, do what you love right here. Mm -hmm. And um, that, 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 that was my, that was my, my green light to just, to just really do what I love and started from high school. I didn't know what I, what I wanted to do. But then when my sister put me in this film class and gave me the camera, my teacher gave me the camera, I fell in love with the camera. Um, and then from there, you just couldn't tell me anything with this camera. I just got connected to telling stories through the camera. And I, I my pursuit was just to do what I love. And this emotions of this movie is a roller coaster. I mean, it, so many times I could have gave up and quit and, and realized like, you know, maybe this isn't for me. But then I had to keep looking back at what my grandfather said and said, do what you love. And I was like, man, I love just pursuing this and creating stuff in my head and bring it to life. And I'm very passionate about that. Um, luckily, in high school, I was editing. And that's where I was also fell in love with the editing process. So um, being the fact that I was able to edit this entire movie to make it look like what it looks like by myself uh, mm. was another blessing. You know what I'm saying? And just any when you talk about the music. Um, you know, I actually was, uh, and, and, and as a kid, I hated listening to music in the car. I don't know why it just irritated me. <laughs> it was just, I couldn't get connected to it in the car, being high in the backseat, being hungry, going to church. It was like, I wasn't connected to music. <laughs> like so I used to scream in my like, please turn it off. But in my own piece, I love listening to music. I love listening to instrument, uh, instrument uh, music like uh, John Williams. I'm a big fan of his music. Um, but, you know, uh, I had I have a good connection with Kuda Love, who's the executive producer, who discovered Mace, discovered uh, 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 Nelly, uh, was uh, Biggie's road manager. He came on board and and he really kind of laid a foundation for the music and supervised that part. Um, yeah. But Jordan Lee Brown, he has a great ear for music too, on on the same likings of minds, and he added his value to the music. So the whole movie has been like a a, a team making journey, 
And, um, you know, but as far as like the biggest emotions is like, it's, it's love. There's a lot of love into that movie. I mean, we made this movie with no money. Like we had pennies, peanuts on this, on this, on this film. So we put a lot of love to make it really come to, come to life. Um, I'm also wondering too, uh, and, and beyond all of just the angelic presence around you to really motivate you, uh, yeah. to get to this point. Uh, was there ever a moment when you realized music videos just wasn't enough for you? I always knew that. Um, you know, I, I, film, I filmed uh, my goal and I accomplished my goal. It wasn't fast, but my goal was to make it to 106 and Park um, yeah. before they kind of ended. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I met Megan Good and it just randomly how I met her. But I met Megan Good and she gave me a call and she was like, yo, Scott, I want you to direct my music video. I got a girl group called Hello Girls. And I made that music video look like a movie because I always knew like, yo, I'm gonna make these music videos. I'm gonna let them pay for my kind of like experience of making stuff, but yeah. I'm gonna make them look like mini movies. And every music video I did has some type of mini movie theme in there. Um, I did a little too much mini movie on Megan Good's video. It was like five minutes long. I was like, man, I'm <laughs> trying to shoot a movie. I'm trying to shoot a music video. And uh, what's crazy enough, she went to 106 and Park right before it ended, and she premiered the music video on 106 and Park. So I accomplished that go. And after that, I was like, you know, I did a couple more videos, but after that, I was like, you know what? I need to make a movie. Like that's what I really want to do. I don't want to be a music video director that transfer over. I just want to make movies. Yeah. Um, when you talk about the inspiration of this film again, coming from um your your uncle and beyond, uh, yeah. th- what what sort of just question is were you did did you re- return back upon this idea like in terms of like really scoping the idea i'm sure the idea was pitched to you and you you took it metabolized it what were some of like the returning questions in terms of like how it needed to be told like how did you how did you truly set on this tone the tone of the film um because it, it, a lot of the acting a lot of performance a lot of the rawness of it is authentic and and to me it's it's a tricky thing. And especially in our community, when you, when you, when you get somebody and let's just call it what it is, when you get somebody that's a thug or whatever it may be, there's acting, but then there's folks that really embodies that essence for it. And across the board, everybody, I think really steps into their characters, probably tapping in something in their life. Um, everybody seems to be on the same play, but in order for everybody to know the play, the coach has to be the one to tell her what it is. And from you, just wondering, like, how did what were sort of the the, the, the questions or uh, some of the rebuttals you had with your uncle in order to like really set things for what it is? Well, you know, um, it was once I got the the story from the dream, it was vivid. It was so vivid. Like I said, the uh, we had wrote and it, it raced, and 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 that was a lot of a lot of information that it raced, but it was still so vivid in my head where I was able to go back and, and continue to write the script. Um, but you know, as me as being, uh, I'm not even a writer, you know, in school, in high school, they, my teacher said, I can't write. I, I failed at English. You know what I'm saying? So ha, to play. them. <laughs> yes, you know what I'm saying? And, and another <laughs> ha, ha is that we won a, a best, best writer at me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So there you go. But, uh, I haters. Said, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, but I, as I must, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm so much a creator. Like even with my music video treatments, I would kind of just create things where it kind of makes sense. I have a good beginning, a good middle, mm-hmm. at least a good end. Um, so writing the scripts, you know, I'm standing up and I'm talking, I'm talking as if I'm that actor and I'm, I'm rewriting the words and, and then, but then when you find a good actor like a Jordan Lee Brown who can add in his own five cents to the dialogue and make it even more uh, in depth is, is what makes it a, a more beautiful natural story. But everybody just kind of. I mean, everyone followed the script, but everybody added a little bit more sauce to it. And that's the beautiful thing about when I direct. I want to give you the vision, let you know what it is, but then I'm going to fall back and see what you can do. And if it ain't right, then, of course, I'm going to just direct you back in the right lane. But, like, even Emperor, while he's playing the video games, he's adding his own yeah. he's adding his own stuff to it. And it's just that's just what makes it more, more natural feeling. No, nah, no doubt. A thousand percent. Um, And, and I, I have to question... <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and a certain part in the film, I'm trying to think, it's no spoilers there. Yeah, there's a there's a beautiful, beautiful 90 cents in Paula. You know, that's 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 a classic right there. I was a little bit worried. I was like, I know my man ain't about to blow this joint up. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but when you talk about the set locations, we talk about your props, we talk about uh, you know, costume design and so on. Um uh, w- 
what, what was sort of the strategy behind things? You know, stepping into the strip club, uh, give, giving, and I mean, you know, strip clubs is iconic in, in the way and in in how that's presented. But, you know, stepping into that setting, the music, as I mentioned, uh, you know, having a classic as a non-assist Impala there, um, all the uh, outfits that everybody was wearing. How did you kind of uh, land on the designs for most of this? Uh, you know, I mean, listen, the Impala is its own story. We went through a couple different cars to get this, oh. to get this Impala. Yeah. Um, Brian Cooper, who did a phenomenal job on, on, on coming on board as a producer and just being, you know, he's from New York. He, he, he hits the streets very well with me. But, uh, once we finally got the Impala, it was like, I'm telling you, I think we've kind of like, uh, what is it called? Uh, we kind of stole the Impala because the, the owner, the original owner, and excuse me, I forgot his name. So, but, uh, he, he always be asking for it, like, Hey, look, we making a movie and, and and we needed it today, but we didn't get to what we get to to actually film it. So we're gonna need it tomorrow. So we <laughs> held that Impala hostage. And and for me, I was like, I, my cars and my my locations, my wardrobe, everything got to be authentic. Like mm-hmm. you know, no diss to the uh, you know the Chris Stokes and the Manny Haley's and stuff like that. But you know, when you go get when you go to like Zara and you or, or you know you get everything and it's so perfect, it doesn't feel as authentic. Um, even like the walls in the house to me, I don't like white walls. I don't like anything that looks like you could just go to the store and buy this. I'm yeah. gonna go to the uh the uh what are those stores? The outlets, the uh, urban outfit, what's the um the uh, thrift markets? I'm gonna go to yeah the yeah thrift markets. Mm-hmm. yeah. So uh, Richie, who uh, became my stylist, uh, we went to the thrift market. And we literally picked out Slice's outfit and it just became so simple where it was like, yo, this is it. The red beanie, the all black, yeah. with, the black with the black boots. Um, Nixon, uh, Michelle Vitar, that's that, that, that she, she actually supported the whole, like, uh, Sissy with her outfit. Uh, that's my wife. So she basically grabbed stuff from her wardrobe and was like, okay, this is Sissy's outfit. And then I got two boys. So she grabbed stuff from my son's for Emperor's outfit. And then even Fizz, I grabbed stuff from, you know, my closet for Fizz's outfit. Um, but I know I, I just want the rungy raw look as like, yo, this is, this is like, let's create this rungy look. You know what I'm saying? Because I need them to feel real. Like nothing where we went to the store and, and had a budget, like, nah, we grabbing stuff from the closet, you know? So everything yeah. with the whole wardrobe and car was just real raw. Like nobody, like we didn't call up uh, what is a car company that rents out cars for, for movies. Like we, I, even the red truck, you know, that red truck. Yeah. You know, we found that downtown in Las Vegas, and I was like, "Yo, this truck is authentic looking." So, you know, <laughs> that's my thing. Yeah. It's authentic looking. Yeah, and it do, man. It, it 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 truly does feel that way. The entire film. This is it, this is why I'm just I'm just so baffled at just you putting together one of your first film, your first film, and just everything in every aspect of the production just really was pieced together, very real, uh, very raw. Uh, and when I say raw, and not in the sense of just like not polished, but it, because I say it was polished, but in the sense of authentic, you know, when I when we say raw, you know, what I mean, it's like that that dude, that dude is raw. It's like, yeah, he got talent. Right. He 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 right. being him true self out there. You know, he not trying to live up to standards or whatever the code is. He he doing what he does, and that that's what I got from this. Like after a while, I just I felt like I, a part of me felt like, man, these like my homies or somebody putting together a film. Like you just, you connect with everybody's performance because everybody's just, you can tell everyone's having fun and everybody's just doing what they're supposed to do. And it just, it came together as a, it's, it's a, a super, super um, solid film, man. Um, I do want to talk about uh, the, the, the closing scene here. We, we have a moment and, and, and folks again, check out, um, run nixon in theaters november 22nd um so i'm gonna talk a little specific about a a particular part of the film um nixon who we know was struggling with um a heart defect and and ultimately this is what leads the family to needing the money and and so on and so on but at the end of the film after he escapes the burning impala which i'm so glad you went cgi and not practical here because i don't know what type of conversation we would have had we would have blew up a classic like that like yeah, come on right. dude <laughs> right, right, yeah. um but can, is there a particular emotion that the fans should be sort of or, or or is it being conveyed to the fans upon this moment of nixon waking up in the uh ambulance and it's kind of like a shocking look but is there is there is there a, a, an emotion or reaction that is being sort of relayed to the fans here with that 
uh, for 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 uh, what Jordan wakes up from the uh, I mean Slice wakes up from the ambulance. Um, oh, okay, that's my mistake. You're right. You're right. You're right. Okay. So then, with that being said, are you are you thinking for? Is there more story you want to tell in this world here, or or are you just giving us a nice a nice get cliffhanger uh, of things? Well, well, let me ask you this: Do you see that this can be a to be continued? I do. I mean, I think, I think, I think these type of stories, uh, a, a father and mother going to all the stints to protect yeah. their son, another kid on the way. Right. Um, and, 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 and truly just how organic they're working together. And then we're learning about the gangs in the neighborhood. We know about, you know, his past a little bit here that I, th- I absolutely think it's a lot. Honestly, I think it's bold that you made a film when I'm sure you very confidently knew you got an eight, eight episode season right here with the stories you could tell. So, um, yeah. but by all means that, yeah, I, I definitely think there's more that could be, that could be drawn out here. Well, yeah, there's, um, yeah, there definitely is. And, and, you know, when people watch the movie and, um, cause slice is so potent in run Nixon and he doesn't, he's like, he's like Denzel Washington where Denzel doesn't talk too much, but he's the strong character in the film. Um, slice Jordan Lee Brown plays that character very well as an antagonist who actually won best actor in the run. I mean, in the Michelle film festival as well. Nice. Um, but he's so potent. Like I was like, okay, He's delivering slice so well, even on set when the warehouse scene that that was a that was the last thing we shot was that warehouse scene. And uh, when he, he that was I think that was the first interaction with uh, Fizz, who plays Dre. Mm-hmm. And we had a we had a we had a stop on the first take because Jordan came out. He does his grumpy. Ha, 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 he does his laugh like this, <laughs> this, this diminishing laugh. And then he talks to Dre. And Dre's holding the gun at him, and he's just like, I, I, I swear to you, it was like watching Mike Tyson in the rain. And I was like, yo, everybody on set was like watching something real go down. It wasn't, we weren't filming mm. movies at that point. It was just so <laughs> real to the point where Jordan had to take a step back. He was like, wait, because it's the first time them two ever met on set, on, on camera. So it was so real. I was like, yo, cut. Hold on. I think Dre even got lost in the sauce on what what he needed to do. That's how good Jordan Lee Brown is with it, and no doubt to 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 uh, Fizz. Fizz just it was just so it was just so much tension and energy where it was just crazy. But then um, just seeing how how talented my man Jordan Lee Brown is, of course I went to go write uh, the sequel to uh, Ryan Nixon, which is called Slice the Revenge. And okay, that's, that's following my man Jordan Lee Brown as he comes back for revenge against the whole squad but it's a whole action impact movie literally it's it's a, it's like a speed bullet train running straight forward that you you can't even get off the force is just bringing you back you can't even get off the script is so crazy and i plan on bringing a detective uh, like a denzel washington to play that role so there's a lot of high hopes for that movie but that's definitely in the works and that we plan on doing that 2024 for sure my guy, my guy. Okay, well, well, we we will reconvene then. Um, last question I have for you is again in this unpredictability in filmmaking. Yeah, having AMC exclusively come to the table here right. to put this film in theaters. What is what was the conversation like? When how did you get approached, or did you pitch anything? And ultimately, still in the deal. Uh, talk about the the, the victory in your camp with this. Man, listen, whew. listen, the movie is making the movie. That's the real movie is how we made this movie. I'm telling you, um, you know, we brought on some key players uh, to sell the movie. We didn't do it. We didn't go to the, the, um, the, the, the typical way where you get a sales agent that comes on board and sells the film, goes to the film festivals and, and orchestrates that. We actually had to go uh, a little bit on the outside where we brought in people that knew people. And we just pitched the movie to different networks, different outlets. Um, and that whole pursuit, I think, took about six months. Um, and these are strong people in the industry that know the other side of the people to say yes. And for whatever reason, they said no. And it was very confusing why, you know, people like BET or Tubi would, would say no when, A, these people that's introducing the film has 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 a strong name and the people that's in the movie like a fizz 
has already a relationship with these different networks. So why say no? And then the movie is what it is. But I, I, I got to say this. My vision has always been theatrical. And and to go theatrical and actually land theatrical is is not something that I I did. It's something that God did. And and literally he made it happen. I mean, I had to get turned down because you know, when someone calls you and says, Hey, we got, for example, BT, they're they're interested in the movie. It looks like it's a good, it's a go. We going we going to the to the bank with this one. You kind of don't think about your real go, but then when you get turned down. I'm pretty sure anyone at that point can get discouraged because it's like you get knocked yeah. down in a sense. You're like, man, I don't know how to get back up from this um, to the point where I was like, man, we just gonna have to upload a movie to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Amazon Prime or something or, or YouTube and see what happens. Like, I don't know where the movie's going. And every day yeah. the actors is asking, like, where is it going? I'm like, man, I don't know. We got turned down. But then when I was sitting in my home theater, I had looked at this sign I got in my theater. It says theater. And it's the popcorn sign. And I got popcorn. I'm in my own movie theater. I'm looking like, nah, I need to be theatrical. I need to be in a movie theater. And I just somehow come up, uh, came across this story called Tosla. And the producer, director who uh, created Tosla, the, the independent film, she had, I looked at her backstory and she had reached out to Regal during the pandemic. And she actually got Regal movie theaters to give her um, a limited amount of theaters. And she said she just cold called. She just hit the phones, cold called, got the deal. And that inspired me. I was like, you know what? If she did it, she, you know, she got it. She went through. Let me see what I can do because I know me. I know if I get on the phones, I can make something happen. And that's yeah. what I did. I looked at AMC and AMC got a beautiful program for independence. They get a lot of submissions, just like the film festivals. And I submitted run this into AMC. But see, I did one key thing that made us get over the hump to get us at AMC, which was I, I researched the key players at AMC in this particular department. And I just kind of found the right player. And uh, her name is Nicole Randolph. And, and thank you, Nicole Randolph. She helped uh, Kevin Hart in his beginning stages um, to get his stuff where, in the very beginning, to get his stuff to where it's at today. And I just sent her a nice email and told her my background, told her about Ron Nixon, told her I submitted it to AMC. She uh, responded back and said, wow, it's an amazing story. Thank you. I gave her her flowers, too. And uh, within two weeks, the team of AMC sent me this email back. And I think that's when I kind of dropped to my knees and was like, wow, God is real. I got the email that said AMC wants to do a full theatrical distribution with Ron Nixon. And that's just how that happened. My man, my man. Yeah, you know, if you had some shit where like a bullet went twisted in the air and curving around, Tubi would have been all over it. You, you know, you know, they like oh, they yeah, shenanigans, yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> right, yeah. So this, you know, you know, Take it for what it is, man. You you were above their standards. <laughs> you know what? And you don't you don't. I I know that for a fact. I know that for a fact. But you don't see that. But I believe at the time I was like they got fifty to sixty million subscribers as African Americans, and 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 forty percent as African Americans. Like okay, everybody's putting their stuff on Tubi, so I guess I'm gonna follow the trend. But I always didn't want to just put my movie on Tubi. But even when I'm outside and I say I got a movie coming out. It's crazy, the, you know, the, the, the black people be like, is it a Tubi movie? I'm like, dang, does Tubi I, have, because you know what's going on. It's a slander too media. nowadays too. It's, it's, it's an it, automatic it, slander. It is, and you know, and, and that's what I'm saying. At the time, I didn't see that, but it's a blessing that, you know, we did get turned down. Obviously, yeah. you know, it was it was meant to be this way. Yep, yep. And, and, and just per advice, because I will say that Tubi has put out a few films um, th that are good. But they also had their limited run on there, so of course they knew what it was too. They was like, "Yeah, we'll 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 throw it on there for three weeks," and they were pulling our film back. So if they decide to come knocking on the door, you know, same posture with them, like, "Oh, y'all didn't want me then, huh? Y'all see, y'all see where I'm at with this." So yeah, we'll do a little something, but after that, it's nah, we we back out. <laughs> nah, you know what? I got I got so so much a strong relationship with AMC. Um, yes, sir. To the, point, to the point where I was able to help another producer director out and get his film uh, uh, picked up by AMC. So it's like, yeah, we're gonna go theatrical from here on out. That's that's the yeah. number one place is theatrical, and then we'll release it through uh, different streaming platforms. But yeah, you know, it's theatrical from here on out for sure. My man, my man. Well, folks, you all go do the work. It is about to be Thanksgiving holiday season. So November 22nd, whether you are going out of town or you are staying in town, family coming in, whatever it may be, 
go take your family go check out run nixon in theaters november 22nd sky is a pleasure to talk to you and oh, yeah we'll be chopping it up real soon man get back to work man because i need that sequel already and again yes, shout sir. out to all of your cast members your production yes. crew everybody that put this together and for for again for it being an independent film this one is truly to me it's hard to even throw that label on there because it just looks that damn good it's it is it's, it, it truly looks just that damn good my guy i appreciate it man that's love man that's that's real love i appreciate that no doubt no doubt thank you everybody for checking out this interview and we'll see y'all back for more content very soon